finishing up notes 11, uh, page 102, um, we have just combined the three, essentially the three different um, uncertainty principles, trade-offs that, that we have uh, been working on into one. And now um, uh, I want to get into this uh, um, central limit theorem. I've got to, first I've got to introduce probability functions. And then before that, uh, as Claire about loves to do, we have a little uh, example okay, of um, how, we, how we look at all this with respect to, uh, uh, as Clairebot usually has, exploration seismograms. So we're going to explore the correlation between uh, different time series. Um, and another way of uh, thinking about that is what's the similarity between different seismograms. Okay. Um, so if, uh, if, if you had two earthquakes that produced exactly the same seismogram, then you would, you would say, all right, that's a, uh, in fact, exactly the same seismogram at, at a whole bunch of different stations across the network. You would say, well, that's got to be, you know, that's, that's, that's got to be a, 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 a duplex, a repeating earthquake, okay, which is very interesting tectonically and, and seismologically. Um, and the key word here is uh, uh, the same, you know, exactly the same. What, what do we mean by that? Okay, I mean, if it's a small earthquake, which duplex earthquakes usually are quite small, and our, our Nevada seismic network is, it doesn't have great coverage everywhere, so there's going to be a lot of noise. Okay, and uh, so, you know, how, how close do, they, do these two seismogram recordings have to be? For us to, uh, or or how close? Uh, yeah, we're comparing the same station um, across different earthquakes. Okay, and how close do the two uh, size ramps have to be for us to call it a duplex? All right, so that's a practical application of this uh, this idea of assessing the similarity between different series. Um, so uh, uh, another way of expressing it is. Um, uh, all right, I, I'm looking at one earthquake, or I'm looking at one shot gather in, a, in an exploration um, in an exploration uh, uh, record, and and I want to detect the similarity between different waves arriving at different places at different times. And if I I'm gonna if I believe that they're the same wave. Then I'm going to say, all right, here we have a seismic phase, and it's and because it's later at a further distance than uh, than it is at a closer distance, so it's um, you know the same the same wave is uh, is appearing on on x of t, and that's near the uh, the source, and uh, it's also appearing on y of t, which is further from the source, at least where I think the source is. Um, if I can then assess uh, the delay between these two, then I get the velocity, which is something that you know we're always trying to assess. And and in in uh, my 692 class, you saw you know several different simple ways of trying to assess it for different types of data sets. Uh, what we would like to do is uh, shift them, find where they uh, quote unquote correlate the best, um, and uh, have them be correlated enough that they they are the same, and they have the same arrival. And then the amount of shift that we've had to apply to uh, uh, to say uh, uh, y of t that would be the delta t that then, given the known distance between the observation points, will give us the velocity. And and even in uh, surface wave seismology, this all kind of got you know this is all very pedestrian and uh, um, uh, and and not not very easy and uh, you know, to track a uh, say a Rayleigh or a, or a, or an LG wave, uh, you know, from one seismometer to another, um, from earthquakes, and the seismometers had to be lined up perfectly, and you know, with the earthquake, and it just was you know really rare to do that. Uh, and then suddenly, ten years ago, we started computing empirical Reed's functions, which were showing us LG waves and Rayleigh waves and everything else, all these other surface waves. And and given that they were empirical Green's functions, we could 
we could compute. We didn't have to have an earthquake in the line of the seismograms. We would just compute the the waves for the lines of seismograms, uh, the lines of seismometers. Excuse me, and um, uh, and then suddenly, you know, we're we're able to get uh, group velocities between uh, uh, between these uh, um, between adjacent or or even distant stations uh, with no problem all across the network. And people like uh, Mike Ritzwaller in Colorado. Um, started coming out with maps of uh, of uh, group velocity, you know, everywhere, say within the uh, uh, within every seismic network that's out there, including ours, and and also everywhere uh, where the uh, transportable array went, the, that uh, part of U.S. array. Um, and all he was doing was was you know he wasn't with group velocities, right? You can't really with an emergent surface wave, you can't really you know find that first arrival time like I'm suggesting here. You've got to correlate them and then get the shift between the two, okay? Uh, and and so that's the lag at maximum correlation, at least maximum non-zero correlation. All right. So um, uh, just to review our concepts of correlation, right? We have uh, um, we have uh, our correlation at uh, at zero shift, which we call the the coefficient of correlation, and it's really just an inner product, right? We take we take all we take the sample of x at t equals zero and and we multiply it by the sample of y at t equals zero, okay, and um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and then we add to that you know x at one times y at one and we add to that x at two times y at two right so that's a that's a cross correlation at zero shift right that's running that cross correlation summation for zero shift. Okay, so so this really looks like a uh, you know getting the uh, the projection of one vector to another. Okay, so you're just multiplying the corresponding times and then adding them all up. Okay, and that's what so this is an inner product, and that's why I put the angle braces on it. Uh, here's an, an inner product of x with itself, so that's a uh, uh, the auto correlation at zero shift, and here is the or the auto covariance at zero shift. Here's the the uh, <clears throat> the y's auto covariance at zero, sh zero shift. And you can see that we're taking the uh, uh, the um, the geometric mean of those of those auto uh, auto correlations, uh, auto covariances. Okay, and we're using those to normalize out the cross uh, correlation. So that gets us this coefficient of correlation c. Uh, now. Um, between uh, between different series, okay, and this is an expression for uh, 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 well for any time series or any any data series that has a, a zero mean, like a seismogram, right? We 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 try to we try to okay, so like a velocity seismogram, right? Not a, a displacement seismogram um, uh, would not have a zero mean, but a velocity seismogram um, for a transient wave should have a uh, zero mean and a uh, uh, and certainly an acceler an accelerogram um, should have uh, zero mean. So this is a definition for the coefficient of correlation between two series, and we're going to think about it in terms of random series. All right, and here's the uh, um, uh, uh, so so you know this is taking that uh, uh, definition of the coefficient of correlation. And then saying, all right, x and y are random series, so we have to do an ensemble average. Okay, so this is the expectation of x times y, right? Expectation of x times y. This is the expectation of x squared. This is the expectation of y squared. So these are, um, you know, this is this is how we get around having a stochastic series where we don't know what's coming next. And uh, by using the expectations ensemble average, if we could ever get it, then that allows us to study an unpredictable uh, series. Now, now so far, um, right? We uh, uh, because we're doing the ensemble average, we're, we haven't said anything about these random series being stationary or or uh, ergodic yet. Okay, so this this equation still works, and that's the coefficient of correlation, of course. Now we don't have the ensembles for x and y. We have n samples of each. Okay. So so what if what if we had one sample? Okay. 
um, and and thus we are we are estimating the expectation, okay, by a time average, okay. So so we're gonna we're gonna you know we can't get the real expectation of anything, uh, and and we have just one sample each uh, of each series, uh, x and y, okay. So um, what do we get here? Uh, we have uh, uh, all right. Here's our our uh, achievable coefficient of correlation, okay, and it's x at that sample times y at that sample divided by the absolute value of x at that sample divided by the absolute value of y at that sample. Now, as you can see, what this is going to do for a random series that have zero mean, this is going to come out to be plus or minus 1. Right? That's, that's what's going to happen. Uh, and we don't know from you know, one lag to another or one series to another. You know, we, uh, um, um, you know, we we uh, we don't know whether it's going to be plus or minus. But I mean, what is a what does a one hundred percent coefficient of correlation mean? That means for these random series, although we only have one sample, okay. I mean, a a, a coefficient of correlation of plus or minus one would normally suggest to us that x and y are exactly the same. But of course, they're random series, and so they're not. They can't be the same. So so you know. Here's the here's the problem. Okay, we try to assess the similarity between two series, and and they have a you know the two series have random components, and if we have too little data, they they're going to end up saying well we got a perfect match. Okay, so we got to pay attention to this because now we can see our coefficients of correlation. I mean they're not they're not only are they going to be, are they going to be uh, uh, maybe unexpectedly variable. The coefficients of correlation are going to have a, a, you know much higher values than we thought. Now, of course, you know having only having one sample of each series is kind of kind of ridiculous. But you know what it boils down to is is just exactly our our good old um, um, uh, our, our good old you know one over square root of n um, diminishing returns uh, factor. Okay. Um, the coefficient of correlation is going to have a variance. It's going to have a bias, right? That makes theoretically uncorrelated data uh, look more correlated by increasing the effective coefficient of correlation. So this uh, this bias, you know, which is the uh, um, the standard deviation of the estimated coefficient of correlation, right? So that's uh, sigma sub c hat, right? Um, it's going to look like one over square root of n. Okay, so the fewer samples we have, you know, the the more uh, um, the more even totally uncorrelated random data are going to look like each other. Okay, so we got too much noise, and and we're going to be finding duplex earthquakes everywhere. Okay, which is uh, you know another reason why it's been so hard to uh, analyze seismicity in in uh, uh, from stations in Las Vegas Basin, so we don't we just don't get a lot of recordings. Okay, so um, of course there's a moral to the story here. Uh, given limited data, and remember every data set you have is limited, it's non-infinite in length. Given limited data, you can find significant-looking correlations where none exist, right? Because uh, you know th this this random data x and y that we're getting the expectation of here, um, you know they are totally uncorrelated, okay? And it's just this you know lame method of doing the time average to uh, um, to estimate the you know very roughly estimate the expectation. That's what gives us so much trouble and causes us to have this uh, this uh, uh, bias upwards on the uh, on how how correlated the data look. Okay, so uh, again, you know, if if you are reviewing a paper that says that you know these uh, one hundred point seismograms, uh, you know, look really well correlated, we're getting coefficients of correlation, uh, you know, of of sixty five percent. It's garbage. Okay, you can you can, you know with one hundred point uh, data sets. 
uh, data series, you can get coefficients of correlation, you know, at 80% between random data. <laughs> so um, that's why uh, uh, that's why in most uh, BSSA papers where they compare uh, synthetics to um, um, to uh, uh, um, so data, they show the synthetic seismograms and the data seismograms because that's what the reviewers want to say. They're not going to believe any statistics. They want to see the they want to see the data. They want to see the synthetic plotted against it, and you know then you let then you let your eye be the judge. Now that can be you know you can fool people's eyes too, um, but uh, at least you're not trying to hide behind any statistics. Okay, so um, all right. With that warning, uh, we're going to launch into uh, uh, probability functions again. Just uh, again, a, kind of a reminder. So we have a random series x sub t, and the um, the successive values of, of uh, x sub t are are equally likely to fall between minus x max and an x max. All right. So. Um, you know, this would be a uh, this would, this is kind of like the results of most pseudo random number generators. Um, they have uh, a uniform probability density function for values of x. <clears throat> okay, let's say x max is one, and thus minus x max is minus one. Okay, the uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, probability most of the the random number generators you'll encounter. You know, we'll try to emulate this this flat um, distribution, and and there's zero probability of getting anything, you know, more negative than minus x max or more positive than x max. All right, and and if this is true, then it's easy to write down um, what the probability is: the probability of getting any value x, uh, of the probability function uh, for getting any value is. Uh, uh, within there is uh, not outside, but within there is one over two times x max. Okay, very uh, very simple. Um, and uh, so uh, we uh, we discretize this, right? We have um, um, we have some number of samples of different possible x values, right? This is not a time discretization. This is a this is a probability. This is a discretization in the um, in the uh, possible values of amplitude. And say if you're, you know, let's say you're you're looking at a uh, um, a, uh, a random integer, okay, and uh, uh, and it's an unsigned integer, and it can take the values from zero to two fifty five. Okay, uh, and uh, as an integer, it cannot take values, say between integers, right? It can't. It can't be two point five. It can't be two fifty five point five, right? So, um, you know, that's a, effectively a discretization of the possible values of x. All right. So, um, uh, you know, if we if we have n samples in our uh, probability function, then uh, what we're going to have is the probability. Uh, function at um, value x value of x i is going to be one over n. Okay, for this uniform probability density function. All right, now if we sum up over all of the discretized values, right, we get one. Okay, and this also works. This summation, I put a box around it because you know the summation to one is is a basic. Uh, principle of, of probability density functions. You know, you integrate them, uh, you sum them up over all possible values of x, and you get a probability of one. I mean, that makes sense, right? Um, you roll a uh, you roll a die. It's got six possible states, right? So n is six. The probability at each state is supposed to be one, since it's not a loaded die, and um, um, and and you add uh, you add up six times one sixth, and you'll get one. Okay, so now we have a few more definitions added to our consideration of probability density functions. 
and uh, I can talk about the central limit theorem. So we take two random series, okay? X, is a, X of t is a random series, y of t is a random series, and we operate on them in some way, okay? Uh, and we get a, and so here we're going to add them. We're going to add the values, right? Uh, and and c of t, c at t is going to be x at t plus y at t. Uh, so um, now we have, uh, you know, x and y may be random series, but we have a probability density function for for each one. And the one for uh, for x is called p sub x. The one for y is called p sub y. The, probabil the probability that the sum will have a certain value c is the sum of all possible ways that this can occur. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, you know this is a summation, but you know how uh, how many different ways you know like if x is rolling one die and y is rolling one die, then you know how are we gonna um, uh, how are we gonna get uh, uh, what's the probability of getting Twelve. What's the probability of getting um, two? Um, you know, you know the probability of getting one is zero. Okay, so that's that's easy. But uh, for dice, but um, you know, here's how you can actually, you know, given your known probability density functions, here's how you uh, uh, and and notice that these probability density functions are sampled now. Okay, they're. Um, you know they're sampled in indices which which correspond to possible values of x or y, and we're going to you know the probability density function for the sum c is also sampled at an index which is all poss you know for for which expresses all possible amplitude values of uh, uh, for the uh, the sum. Okay, so so these probability density functions they're data series right. They're not time series. Uh, I'm reluctant to call them amplitude series. Uh, they're probability series. Okay, I, uh, you know that that's okay. Um, so, but they're they're data series. So all the same operators that we we use to apply to time series and spatial series, uh, data series, they apply to probability series. Okay, to probability density functions. Okay, so. Um, uh, doesn't this look kind of familiar, right? This is a this summation here is a convolution, right? We have uh, if you think about how to get a certain value of uh, in C, you know the probability of getting that p sub C is going to be equal to this uh, summation convolution, right, of the probability density function of x times the probability density function of y equal to C minus x. <clears throat> okay. Think about how that's how that's going to work. Okay. Uh, for instance, you know, how do you get? Uh, uh, what's the probability of getting of each one getting one is one sixth, and so the probability of getting two is is going to be um, uh, uh, is going to be one thirty sixth. Um, okay. So uh, all right, we can. Take this equation here with this summation convolution in it, and we can z transform it. And now z, you know, z is not the the uh, the unit time delay operator; it's the unit amplitude bias operator, if you like. Okay, because we're we're working on an amplitude axis here, you know, these probability density functions. But fine, we can z transform. It's just a data series, right? All the same mathematics applies. So we have, you know, instead of con convolving in the probability function axis, we are just multiplying in the probability function z axis. Okay, so we have p p sub x of z times p sub y of z. Right? These are just uh, we take these series and we make them into z transforms. You know, with coefficients of powers of z, and that that uh, product is going to give us p sub c of z. The probability density of a sum of random series is the convolution of their probability density functions. Okay, uh, and so here now expressing it in terms of uh, uh, the continuous uh, form, the uh, the convolutional integral. 
So p uh, of c is equal to the integral of p of x at alpha, that's the dummy variable for the amplitude, right? Uh, times p sub y of c minus alpha d alpha. And uh, p sub c is equal to um, you know, p sub x convolved with p sub y. So we're, we're taking these probability density functions, whatever shape they have, and we're convolving them as if they were time series. Now, what about, <clears throat> what about a difference? Okay, what if d, different, the, the series d is equal to x minus y? Okay, well, then we could follow the same development, and we would get p of d is equal to the convolutional integral of p uh, sub x, uh, p for x at alpha times p for y at, so now here's, the, here's where the difference comes in. Instead of uh, c minus alpha, it's alpha minus d. That's all. And then we get the convolution. Uh, so this is a convolution of, uh, um, of p of uh, x at alpha convolved with p of y at minus alpha. So that's like a cross correlation between the two, okay? just because we did a difference. Now, uh, what's gonna, you can see what's going to happen here is that as we do anything add, you know, and multiplying, that's just like, that's just like adding. It's just adding many times, right? That's multiplying. Um, you know, uh, uh, dividing is subtracting many times, OK? So um, every time we do an operation, and we are, you know, we've, we've explained here what happens when we add two series, random series, OK? We are convolving probability density functions. So what do we get? You know, we begin with the probability density function, uh, this uniform probability density function, which is a boxcar, right? And we um, uh, we have a uh, uh, another uniform probability density function for y. We convolve the two. Of course, we get a triangle. You already knew that, okay? And what if we continue? We have uh, you know maybe we're adding four numbers, four series, okay? And um, and 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 so four series, you know, we get a triangle from uh, probability density function from two of the series. We get another triangle probability density function from the other two series. Convolve two triangles. It's going to look kind of. Um, it's going to look start looking like a bell curve. It's going to start looking like a, a Gaussian. Okay. And so you know, if we add n series of numbers, what we're going to get is the probability density function in z raised to the power of n. You know, multiplied by itself n times, and that's why the easiest way, uh, at least for me, to you know, I, I take these random number generators, you know, that are provided in uh, you know systems like Python or Java, and they all claim to have you know uniform probability density functions, and what I want is a random number that has a Gaussian probability density function, so I just uh, uh, I just get twelve random numbers and add them, okay. Taking uh, capital N equal to uh, 12 is sufficient. That looks really Gaussian, at least to me. Okay, um, so that's uh, uh, you know, and and so as n goes to infinity, okay. Here's the central limit theorem. As n goes to infinity, uh, the probability density function of the whole conglomeration, p sub g, becomes Gaussian. Regardless of the form of p of x, they don't have to be they don't have to be uh, uniform. Okay. Now there's a couple of exceptions. All right, a couple of exceptions. Right. Um, if if uh, if if there are two maxima in the probability density functions of equal height. Okay, and they have to be equal. They have to be exactly equal. Then then it'll it'll you'll get you know, multi-mode uh, probability density function, um, which I used to call PDFs, but that doesn't work anymore. Um, you'll get a multi-mode probability density function that has two Gaussians, okay? One around each of the equal height uh, maxima, okay? Um, let's see, d or d squared p sub x uh, dx squared, the second derivative with respect to x amplitude is equal to zero at its maximum, um, and uh, uh, 
what does that mean? Um, um, if the second derivative is zero, um, that means uh, you have a, a, a slope at the maximum. Um, I'm having trouble visualizing it. Somebody, somebody, tell me what they think. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely not a you know a Gaussian has zero slope at the maximum, but the second derivative is is uh, strongly negative. I think. Um, so what does it mean if the if the second derivative is so negative? The second derivative of the Gaussian, like a Rickert style way of thinking. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Ricker wavelet would have to be would have to would have to come out to be zero, right? Right. So well, Gauss, so Gaussian has has a highly non-zero second derivative at its maximum, right? It was that it was that you know big downswing yeah. in the second derivative. Yeah. I mean, it was zero slope, but yeah, it was definitely non-zero. Right, right. So if the second derivative is zero. Maybe that means that it's not. There's no curvature. At uh, at the maximum, which is uh, uh, that's that's kind of weird, but um, um, uh, maybe that's uh, maybe that's what it means. Okay, so so uh, you know unless you have you have probability density functions that have exactly equal height, and do you think in nature? You know, you ever find you know bimodal probabilities that have exactly equal height? No, they just never come out that way. Um, <clears throat> or you have this weird uh, second derivative being zero. Okay, um, uh, everything becomes Gaussian. The more you work with it, the more you do to it, the more Gaussian it becomes. The more you filter it, the more you sum it, the more you average it. Uh, you do anything, and it just becomes more and more Gaussian. Okay, so uh, that's that's uh, <clears throat> that's 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 why Gauss's work is so, you know, so popular. It's so useful because everything around us is Gaussian. Okay, black body radiation. Um, you know, if you um, if you get a uh, uh, um, uh, if you get a probability density function for the amplitudes of the sound of my voice, you know it's going to be Gaussian. Um, everything is Gaussian. <clears throat> uh, just because it Gauss, it's Gaussian doesn't mean it can't be fractal. I mean that's a that's a later piece of statistics uh, that uh, uh, you know continues to uh, um, uh, continues to amaze us actually. <clears throat> okay, so since data are the sum of complex, you know, real data from physical processes are the sum of complex linear summations, okay, we are going to observe Gaussian probability densities everywhere, and, and that's why it's so useful. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, you know why the why the concept of the uh, standard deviation has uh, has you know so much so much utility. You know it's it's got real physical significance, right? The the standard deviation of this uh, uniform probability density function is not really worth much. Okay, uh, it doesn't tell you that much. What really you know the uniform probability density function is is you know, the only useful thing is what's x min, what's x max, okay? But um, um, standard deviation is not a useful thing. But these uh, uh, these uniform probability density functions, they are not. Um, <clears throat> they are they the uniform probability density functions are are uh, are very artificial. You know, we can make them in a computer. Um, but that's about it. Everything else we observe, um, you know, travel times, uh, delays, velocities, um, uh, amplitudes, uh, you know, everything else we observe is uh, uh, 
is Gaussian. Okay, so that um, that concludes the um, um, that's the end of our story so far as one-dimensional time series goes. Um, in 757, I take these concepts a lot farther, and we first develop them for um, uh, for one-dimensional time series. Uh, and we're, we'll, we will work on concepts such as um, inverse filtering and uh, 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 inverse uh, Inverse convolution, and uh, and we'll actually uh, get you know from one dimensional time series, we'll actually get uh, a first view of of what does tomography mean, and how can we use that in imaging. Okay, so um, there's a lot of uh, great concepts that that you can develop first um, with um, uh, with one dimensional time series just for uh, uh, deconvolution purposes, okay. Uh, you know, trying to uh, get rid of the uh, the path and and side effects and getting back to the source processes of, of the earthquakes, okay. Or getting rid of the source uh, the source effects and the and the uh, the service consistent uh, uh, side effects as as they are, uh, and getting to the uh, the reflectivity series, okay. So these are all uh, uh, these are all very heavily involved in uh, inversion, <coughs> and uh, especially iterated inversion. And it's only in, in really in 757 that you'll find out what I what I mean by uh, processing uh, versus inversion. Okay, so uh, we've set up the basis of uh, uh, of that for a time series, um, and. Uh, I haven't really gone beyond um, what's essentially, uh, you know, pseudo linear um, considerations. You know, where we're just dividing, you know, one spectrum by another, uh, or uh, or uh, you know, flipping uh, uh, zeros to poles, that sort of thing. Okay, those are that's that's called quasi uh, analytic analysis. Okay, that's all we've done so far. Uh, we haven't really gone into uh, doing actual iterated inversions. Uh, for deconvolution, <clears throat> and and that has to wait till 757 because what we're going to do next is um, is really a look at uh, you know here's here's you know what you've had now is kind of look a look at the inversion side with this quasi analytic analysis okay um, for one dimensional seismograms now we're going to flip to two dimensional seismograms okay or seismic records as used in exploration seismology. And as I hope you will realize, uh, can and should be uh, used uh, for uh, network seismology. And we're going to um, we're going to take an entirely non-inverse approach. We're going to take the processing approach. Okay. Um, so it gives you gives you two sides, you know, on different kinds of data, and then we don't really see the relationship between those and combine them until we get to uh, seven fifty seven. Um, but uh, I, I believe the uh, uh, the concepts you'll find in this class will still be quite useful. <clears throat>